Crisis in Egypt. A little-known armed group takes responsibility for killing a high-ranking military officer. As well as security, the country struggles with food shortages and price hikes. So how's the government dealing with the challenges? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Sami Zaydan. There seems to be little respite for an Egyptian government plagued by challenges. Rising food prices and Sinai insecurity are producing some of the latest crises. On Saturday, a senior army officer, Brigadier General Adel Dragai, was killed outside his home in Arbor city, 35 kilometers northeast of Cairo. He was an armored division commander who had served in northern Sinai. And that's where the government has been fighting several armed groups, including those it says are linked to ISIL. Hundreds of soldiers and police officers have been killed. This just adds to the political instability since President Hosni Mubarak was forced to step down in 2011. Its first democratically elected leader, you'll remember, Mohamed Morsi, was deposed by the military. Then General Abdel Fattah al-Sisi became president and led a major crackdown against the Muslim Brotherhood. Well, fighters in Egypt have killed hundreds of policemen and soldiers, mostly in the Sinai Peninsula. But such attacks on senior officers are rare. Let's take a look at the group that's taken responsibility for killing the Brigadier General then. The newly formed armed group called Lua Athora, or the Revolution Brigade, said on Twitter it was behind the attack. Its Twitter account was suspended shortly after it made the claim, though. It's the first time the group rose to prominence was when it targeted policemen in Munafia province in August. Two police were killed during an ambush and five others were injured, including two civilians. Now, Egypt's security situation has been unstable. The military is fighting several armed groups in the Sinai and the violence has increased since President Mohamed Morsi was deposed. The lack of security has hurt Egypt's vital tourism industry, which was already struggling after the 2011 revolution. That's left the government facing an economic slump, with a high unemployment rate of around 13% and rising inflation. Many blame President Sisi and his government for the problems. Let's get the thoughts of our guests. We have here in Doha, Mohammed Al Masri, Associate Professor of Media and Cultural Studies at the Doha Institute for Graduate Studies. In London, we have Omar Ashour, Senior Lecturer in Security Studies at the University of Exeter, and also in the British capital, Wafiq Mustafa, Chairman of the British Arab Network and author of Egypt, The Elusive Arab Spring. Welcome to you all. If I could start with Omar in London, who is this group, the banner of revolution that's claimed responsibility? What do we know about them? Well, uh, not much really. Uh, the, uh, the group came to the fore in uh, September uh, when they issued uh, and took responsibility for an attack on a, a, a small uh, uh, police uh, unit uh, um, and uh, killed most of the soldiers. Most of them were lo low ranks, uh, took responsibility uh, for that, issued a statement which was quite unique in a sense that it, it was not uh, uh, religious intensive, if you wish, it was not using a lot of Quranic verses like the, some of the jihadist group or some of the armed Islamist groups do. Uh, it was talking about the people being the uh, the, the uh, only source of sovereignty, only, only because it's a very thorny issue. Uh, is it is it the people, the the ultimate sovereign, or is it God within within the Islamist and jihadist debate? So it was taking this stance, uh, you know, more on the uh, the peoples are the are the sovereign, the ultimate so sovereign. Uh, and it uh, more or less elaborated uh, on uh, it is fighting to gain back the uh, objectives of the revolution, uh, framing its uh, narrative more or less around uh, uh, social injustices, economic deprivation and so on. So that was a low rank and it was in, in, in more or less a range of uh, uh, small, uh, relatively speaking, decentralized organizations that uh, popped up after the July 2013 coup. Some of them ended like Ajnad Masr. Some of them formed into or formed a coalition like the Popular Resistance. Uh, it was composed of five uh, of these smaller groups. Uh, and then also uh, uh, the, the, their campaign uh, uh, ebbed to, to a certain degree. Uh, and then now we have uh, 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 the uh, Revolution Brigade. 
the revolutionary brigade now this is the uh, uh, this is a big operation this is not like All right, a, but, uh, let me jump in here Omar, before we get into the uh, to the actual operation let me take the question to the studio here why target we got a little bit of uh, brief there background about the the group but why target this uh, brigadier general adil ragai well he was actually uh, one of the people leading um, some of the what the islamist groups in sinai perceive as repression uh, against both the, the locals in, in the Sinai province and also the people of uh, Gaza. He was overseeing uh, specifically this, the, the operations against the tunnels that link uh, Egypt with uh, the Gaza Strip, right? These are tunnels that have been used to transport uh, vital goods to the, to the people in, uh, in Gaza. So he was responsible. He was responsible for a big area, wasn't he? Five governorates, I think. I mean, the Sinai, even uh, part of Cairo. Yeah, I mean, is it possible to pinpoint the reason why he was targeted as being what's going on in, on the Gaza border and Sinai or the instability in Cairo? I think it's probably a combination, right? Um, but these armed groups, it's not, you know, these, these high-ranking Egyptian officers travel in a lot of security. It's not easy to, to get to them, right? right? So this is a situation where he had left his house without much security, certainly that you know the 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 in, this insurgents were monitoring his house they had an opportunity and they from their perspective you know they they seized it um, but I think the larger issue here is the backdrop of violence we've seen a cycle of violence in Egypt that's gone that's been going on now for the better part of three and a half years you saw that the state um, perpetrate massacres against civilians there were the mass death sentences obviously the mass arrests the torture in the prisons um, and then you've seen the, quite frankly, very predictable pushback. All these all right. dormant well, uh, forgive groups me, uh, that Omar uh, I do spoke want to. Of. That is a very good point, which we do want to pick up on about the cycle of violence and where that's taking the country. But before we go too much big picture at this point, let me bring Wafiq into the discussion. And, and if we could focus on this particular assassination, how sophisticated of an operation uh, does this appear to be? Yeah, first, I would like to condemn the attack on this uh, officer um, and in my heart and my prayer to his family. Uh, the second thing, it is clearly uh, there is an unanswered questions about how did this gang of extremists or revolutionary got through to uh, the house of uh, this high-ranking officer because he lives in an area which is well protected, well secured, and uh, the story is not complete somehow. And they seem there to is, know his movements a, and his timings pretty well. Exactly. Is this an insider job or um, it's uh, the government has been uh, more or less forcing black out on the news or a comprehensive investigation of the site. Media is not allowed, and the only few short statements which has been distributed. Mm. It uh, raises a lot of questions how they were able to get through, how they were able to escape so easily, and uh, there is a lot of questions. I'm uh, uh, quite uh, puzzled about uh, the whole incident of uh, killing such a senior. Um, military officer, uh, particularly he's surrounded by many officers too around uh, living in the same district. So right. uh, I feel there is more political size to it than just uh, blaming one side or another. Do, do you think, uh, Mohammed, that this represents some kind of new stage in the battle between the armed groups and the authorities looking at the rank of this officer, looking at the fact that he was assassinated in Cairo rather than the majority of sort of, shall we say, Sinai-related violence, if this were, is what, you know, it is, um, that usually takes place in the Sinai, doesn't it? Right. I think it's too early to, to say. I think we need to see what the, the coming weeks uh, uh, hold. But I think it's important to, to call to mind, this is not the first time a high-ranking uh, Egyptian government official has been targeted and assassinated. Just over a year ago, Hisham Barakat, the prosecutor general, was targeted not in Sinai, but he was targeted and assassinated in the heart of Cairo, in the midst of a lot more security than 
uh, Adil Ragai was in. So but that was a year ago. When, right. You know. Well, that's why I'm saying we have to wait and see what happens right. in the coming weeks and in the in the coming months to see if this is some sort of an escalation or if this is just the 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 insurgents kind of picking their spots, if you will. Well, well maybe now is a good time to turn to the question which uh, you pose, the bigger picture. But let me take that to Omar Ashur in London. Omar, the big picture of the cycle of violence, the government efforts and vows that it was going to destroy what it calls terrorism, armed groups. What does that picture look like today? Uh, pretty dismal. The uh, situation is as follows. Uh, the, uh, the regime uh, post uh, July 2013 decided to escalate its uh, uh, an already military campaign that was going on for since 2011 in the north of Sinai. But this time the escalation was unprecedented in, in Egypt's history really. Uh, you had for the first time aerial bombardment in civilian areas. Uh, uh, using heavy art uh, artillery uh, in civilian areas uh, based on uh, some sort of intelligence that uh, there are five armed men moving in this area. Um, you had the, uh, uh, the uh, accusations for uh, General Raga'i was uh, uh, destroying uh, the, um, uh, the, some of the homes and the, and the farms uh, on the border area with uh, Gaza and the statement that was issued by the, uh, by the brigade, by the Revolution Brigade basically uh, takes some of the numbers that were uh, that were the interesting part is that this is some of the low estimates this is the numbers of human rights watch and some of the low estimates on what was going on there it's uh, exactly the same number repeated in the statement to basically justify the the, 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 the murder uh, and uh, the, the uh, th that's on one end uh, on the other end you saw the uh, the Sinai insurgency specifically uh, gaining more uh, capacities, uh, able to uh, hit, uh, as you know, a few uh, days ago, able to hit in the west of Sinai. Most of the insurgency is uh, centralized in the north uh, uh, of uh, northeast of Sinai. Uh, was able to hit in the west of uh, of Sinai, and uh, you know, in the, between 2013 and uh, and today, was able to strike in central delta, in uh, upper Egypt, uh, in Cairo, and in the western desert. Uh, you saw also a, a level of sophistication that is uh, more or less unprecedented as well in, in Egypt's modern history in terms of the guerrilla uh, warfare tactics, ability to. Uh, now, Omar, uh, how, use, how much uh, coordination like is there between these different groups? I don't think there's uh, uh, that much coordination except of having a common enemy. Uh, they seem to be varying in their uh, levels of capacities, in their sophistication, uh, in their locations. Right. Uh, the networks that uh, the decentralized, the smaller groups, uh, usually operated in about five governorates, uh, uh, Cairo, Giza, uh, Beni Suef, uh, Fayyum, and Sharqiya. Most of the action was going on there. Uh, the ones in North Sinai were, took responsibility for, for specific operations in Central Delta, Cairo, and, and Upper Egypt, but the, the, it was one operation, so one-off time, uh, issue a statement, say specifically why did they do it, uh, and then it ends there. Uh, right. the, uh, that may, case uh, is, is, is one of the most complex cases because this is the highest ranking senior military officers that get assassinated since uh, uh, Anwar Sadat, since President Sadat in 1981. Uh, so to be able to pull that off and, and, and disappear, uh, this is a, a, a big well, it change. It requires a level of sophistication there. and planning, obviously, to do that. Wafiq, if yeah. we broaden it yeah. f further out, how worried are authorities about any possible return uh, of street protests, particularly with November 11th looming in the air and the vows to organize more street protests from some of the opposition quarters? I think, I think that's a very important factor, um, which uh, really big lot of questions about uh, what CC and the military going to do about uh, 11th of November protests. Uh, because I have a feeling uh, there is a division in the military itself uh, about uh, Sisi's um, leadership. And uh, as you can see, the economy is collapsing. The Egyptian currency virtually um, lost more than 50% over the last uh, two years alone. 
uh, and the Egyptian economy is collapsed, and there is a political isolation of Sisi as well within the Arab world, uh, within the Middle East, and within the world at large. Well, Rafiq, I mean, who and can organize a serious sort of street protest challenge to the government right now? I guess supporters of the uh, regime there could argue that the Muslim Brotherhood has been smashed. Uh, many of the leaders of, of some of the more secular youth movements have been arrested. Is there anyone out there able to rally and mobilize? large numbers of people? I could imagine it will be very difficult, particularly after the killing of the general. It will be a big pretext to increase the hand of the police in the street, and the repressive measures will be taken. A lot of people will be arrested. There will be a lot of media calls for no protests. I think um, it's a very big, uh, big pressure in, on the Egyptian youth and on the young people in the media as well. A lot of them, about 50 or 60 young media people, newspaper men, have been jailed. There are 60,000 people in jail right now in Egypt. I feel the Egyptian regime is uh, going to use this as a pretext to um, use very uh, hard tactics mm. um, against uh, anybody who will come down in the street on the 11th of November. But I hope the people will defy this, because that's been going on. And Egypt is going to collapse as a country if it continues like this, particularly some countries in the Gulf have right. started even pulling away from Egypt. OK. Uh, well, Fik mentioned there the economic situation. If you look at some of the well, the basic statistics like inflation, of course, and prices, very sensitive issue in Egypt. It has been linked to uh, disturbances uh, in Egypt's modern history before, going back to the days of Anwar Sadat, hasn't it? And, and the last few months we've seen, according to the official statistics agency, CAPMAS, even they report that in urban areas we had, for example, in September prices rising 14.1%. The month before that, 15.5%. It's kind of improved a bit this month because the government took steps towards uh, devaluation of the currency. But everyone is, uh, you know, a lot of the economists are saying this is not going to last. How dangerous a development is that? I think it's very dangerous. Um, and I think the reason why it's so dangerous, in some ways even more dangerous to the government than these uh, terrorist groups, these insurgents, um, is because the economic situation affects all Egyptians. There was mm -hmm. just a report uh, about how uh, the, the, the devaluation of the pound and the increased price of imports, as, you know, particular sugar and other uh, uh, common goods, um, are uh, affecting the common Egyptian families in the middle class, lower class, and even in the in the upper class. It's difficult to make a to make a cup of tea uh, in Egypt. So, so what's the, the plan? I mean, does the government have a plan, or is are the economics in free fall, yeah. as, as well, some of the opposition no, the, claim? There, uh, unfortunately, the regime's economic strategy has uh, failed. Uh, uh, abysmally, right? We, we're talking about a government that their, their prize project was the Suez Canal expansion. That has failed dramatically. In fact, not only have uh, revenues from the canal not increased, they've decreased by tens of millions of dollars year over year. You have this, uh, the Al Sima Al Jadida, the new capital, the Dubai-like capital that they were planning on building. That has, uh, you know, plans for that capital have fallen through. So there's no sustain, there's not really a sustained uh, plan uh, to get Egypt back on its sort of its economic legs. The major problem, and this is why all of the crises in Egypt are related, right? You have the political crisis, the economic crisis, and the, um, the uh, security crisis. They're all tied together because these insurgents, the, the terrorist attacks, what they do is they scare away foreign investors. No one's investors. going to put their money in a country exactly. where they scare about. away foreign investors, they scare away tourists. Egypt is an economy that relies fundamentally on tourism, which has decreased dr dramatically in the in the Sisi uh, era. So until the government can do something to convince people to come back to Egypt, we're not going to see the, the, the pound rebound, and we're not going to see uh, any sort of an economic revival. Uh, Omar, what about International banking, can Egypt, to what extent can Egypt still rely on Gulf money, Gulf Arab money coming in to save the day? Not so much really. Uh, Egypt has been uh, uh, more or less taking a lot of, uh, I wouldn't say Egypt, but I say the, the Sisi regime specifically, been taking uh, quite a few 
uh, financial aid packages from the Gulf, but uh, beha politically behaving in a way that contradicts uh, Saudi specifically and most of the Gulf foreign policies, especially in areas like uh, in, in, in issues like the, the Syrian crisis, uh, issues like uh, the, the Yemeni crisis. Uh, and most recently, even issues that has to do with the, uh, you know, the, the Moroccan Polisario uh, uh, conflict, where uh, so you had, you know, the vote, the vote in the Security Council uh, for the uh, continuation of uh, Russian bombardment in uh, on Aleppo, which contradicts what the the, the, the Saudi stance and the Gulfian stance in general. Uh, and uh, you had this, uh, you know, big promises that uh, you know they can help in Yemen uh, militarily if the aid comes. The aid comes, and there's no help in Yemen, uh, and uh, no involvement there, mainly for internal dynamics to keep the balances within the military. Uh, and then more recently, you know, meeting up with the uh, uh, Polisario Front in an attempt to uh, go a bit closer uh, uh, to Algeria and perhaps get some uh, uh, energy uh, aid from fr from the Algerians, but at the same time. Um, you know, causing a, a negative reaction on the part of the Moroccans and on the part of the Gulfians as well, who uh, do not uh, uphold the Polisario cause. So the, the, the relation has been uh, quite tense, uh, and uh, it, it's, the, the whole strategy is about where to, gain, to, to get aid from. It's, it's, it's aid intensive uh, or aid seeking uh, strategy. Uh, but it does not look internally on how to resolve actually the crisis. It's just about, about extracting some money, some economic bonanza uh, from somewhere. Uh, but uh, and it's not, uh, this is a tactic, you know, just to, to, to alleviate right. some uh, or to buy some time. Uh, but it's not really a, a comprehensive economic strategy to uh, uh, do any kind of reform. And of course, any kind of economic reform in Egypt will require a political and social reform, will require social uh, depolarization, will require political uh, de-escalation, and, and will require uh, a whole set of uh, uh, reconciliation policies that I don't think this regime can afford to do. Well, Fik, what about other international countries, the West? Uh, it seemed like after the uh, overthrow of the first democratically elected president that the West changed its view back to the military or security narrative and stability narrative regardless of the price of, of human rights in the region. Do you see any reason to suspect that that might change if the smoke and the rumblings coming out of the engine? I think uh, the West is uh, distancing itself slowly from Sisi uh, and his government. Uh, because Sisi, How so? Lost what what signs and indications have you noticed that make you reach that conclusion? Uh, I noticed that when Sisi went to the United Nations, for example, he hardly met any Western leaders. Certainly, Obama have shunned him away uh, in uh, uh, in the G20 meetings and at the United Nations. And I feel uh, Sisi is in real trouble. And actually, he is a big obstacle for Egypt to moving forward. And I think the military probably uh, confused what to do because they don't have any political vision. Because any political vision has to entail political reform, have to entail civil society, have to entail democracy, rule of law, getting people out of prison to create form of trust. Because you're not going to have to raid, you're not going to have to raise as long as such negative. Uh, Vibes comes from Cairo about killings, about security situation in Sinai. Um, there's hardly any tourism uh, from any country, even the country which is friendly. And some countries in the Gulf, like Saudi Arabia, have a uh, lot of uh, thoughts uh, which are not comfortable for Sisi. And I think Egypt have received about $50 billion in aid from the Gulf countries since Sisi came to power. And this is a huge corruption rings taking, siphoning out this money because it does not show on the ground. There is a shortage of sugar, wheat, food, there is poverty. And actually, I would think there will be starvation very soon in Cairo. A, a very worrying sort Egypt. of scenario being painted there. And when you have uh, the, uh, the political process being smashed and fractured by, you know, the, the abuses of human rights, which uh, a lot of organizations have documented. What sort of picture does that paint for the future political, stable political evolution in Egypt? Not a pretty one. Uh, many analysts have predicted that uh, another uprising, another revolution in Egypt is not a matter of if, 
but when, right? And Dr. Uh, Wafi. You really think there's appetite for that on, on the streets? Well, I think that, you know, Egyptians are getting to the point, it's, it's sort of that breaking point. Mm. You know, when is it going to happen? I don't think anybody knows. Are we talking about months or are we talking, uh, are we talking about years? But so many uh, Egyptians are struggling with sort of their day-to-day uh, lives, right? They're not able to, to right. buy, they're not able to buy enough, you know, food to put on the table. That so it, that's always at some point, point. At some point, you're going to reach a, a boiling point, right? All right, thanks so much. We are out of time. Let's thank our guests, uh, Mohammed Al-Masri here in the studio, Omar Ashour and Wafiq Mustafa. And thank you too for watching. You can see the show again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, head over to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Sammy Zaydan, and the whole team here for now, it's goodbye.